Death and taxes. Throughout history, the only thing people could be sure of was death and taxes. As Benjamin Franklin said, nothing is certain except death and taxes. And for once, this episode of Dark Side History will not be dealing with death. death. Making taxes when you think about it, the only certainty right now. At least for this episode. But when it comes to taxes, the forms that taxation and tribute takes is not certain. And regarding the terms taxation and tribute, it would be good for this episode to start with the difference between them. Though in many cases the lines between them can be blurred. And let's start with tribute. Tribute, unlike taxes, are given within the framework of a client relationship, where one part is subservient to another. This does not mean that tribute cannot be reciprocal in its nature. It does not always have to be extortion, as there can exist agreements of being given privileges in return for payment of tribute. For example, protection or use of land to live upon. But these privileges are not standardized rights, as in the case with the reciprocity found in taxation, ideally, where you get certain rights as a citizen paying taxes and these are defined by standardization through law rather than through interpersonal or interfamilial agreements between individuals and families like for example how serfs paid a part of their production in return for the right to use the land to the landowner the local lord or how local lords and leaders often paid tribute to greater kings or emperors to a central hegemon that they answered to in return for privileges or simply for avoiding conflict. And the payment relationship of tribute is based upon personal or interfamilial agreements or impositions, unlike taxes which are based upon standardized quotas and rates with standardized times of payment through formal law. It should be pointed out that through most of antiquity and the medieval period, taxation and tribute was often not standardized through formalized legal institutions, but often a result of a patchwork of personal agreements and personal impositions upon various people, with entirely different conditions for various local areas and people. A more standardized taxation does not begin to become more common until during the renaissance period where Europe began to develop stronger centralized states. Though some more centralized empires did impose standardized taxes. For example the Roman Empire, various Chinese dynasties from the Qin dynasty forward and the various Arabic caliphates as some examples. And there did often exist at least some standardization when it came to taxation and tribute, even outside of these entities. And even in the cases of these various entities, there existed mixes of tribute and taxation. In fact, the word tribute comes from the Latin word tribus, which means tribe, and is ultimately derived from tri, free in Latin, as Rome was founded by three Latin tribes who demanded tribute be given to them. And the Latin word for tribute is tributa, which also is the Latin word for tax, generally. So the borders between taxation and tribute are blurred. Pure standardized taxation systems, with more or less only formalized tax rates, did not really come into being until very late in the 18th century in Europe. And even then, some did not come about until in the 20th century. Regarding how taxes were collected throughout history, there existed several ways and several systems. And I'm not going to go through them all as that would be impossible, but I will mention some examples, giving brief overviews about them. And let's start with the famous Roman Republic and Empire. In Rome, the taxation system changed a lot, depending upon period, with standardized taxes upon citizens. During the Republic, it began with 
a centralized taxation bureaucracy that gave private individuals the ability to form or collect taxes that would later be paid into the centralized bureaucracy that had set certain quotas for private collectors to collect. These private collectors were private citizens given the magisterial office of publicani and in exchange for collecting taxes they received a portion of the taxes for themselves. But as the Roman Republic turned into the Roman Empire, the publicani would become more bureaucratized and fall more directly under the state and be more standardized in how and by which means they were allowed to collect taxes and what type of taxes they were allowed to collect according to more stricter defined rules of taxation rather than just meeting certain quotas and use whatever means were available as previously there had been a lot of issues about these tax collectors doing things that caused problems in their pursuit of meeting quotas in order to enrich themselves again as they received a part of their taxation for themselves. This bureaucratic somewhat standardized system of quasi state controlled quasi private tax collection would be the main source of income for the Roman state during the Republic and early Empire. However, after the crisis of the 3rd century and into the later Empire, more tributary systems would take over in the later Empire, and especially in the Byzantine Empire, with tribute taken from local lords, granted land through, for example, the Pronoia system. Thus, in the later Roman Empire, we can see a move towards decentralization and deformalization and deinstitutionalization of the taxation systems, with revenue brought in more through personalized agreements than through standardized law. Though it should be said that throughout Roman history there always existed a system of parallel tribute by non-citizens and subjugated groups around the empire, which changed from place to place. So even during the height of the standardized taxation systems, there existed other systems parallel to them. And going away from Rome and moving to the Arabic caliphates of the Umayyads and the Abbasids, where you could say that there existed three systems of tribute and taxation. One system used for Muslims and one system used for non-Muslims and a system used for subjugated areas and groups with greater autonomy. As for the system that was used for Muslims, standardized taxes such as the zakah and other sorts of agreed upon tribute often connected to mosque owned land estates and people bound to these estates were collected by local mosque congregations and their leadership and then reported and given to the caliphal central authority according to various agreements so you had a tax system locally but a tribute system higher up with regards to the caliph and in many cases refusals of paying tribute to the caliph were common as a sort of protest and the central caliphal authority didn't have many options except forcing the issue for force of arms if possible or coming to some sort of agreement in whatever matter had created the withdrawal of the payment of the tribute. For non-Muslims, and also in part for Muslims too to a certain degree, there existed a separate divan or administration for taxes such as the Jizya tax, the Kharaj land tax and the Asher land production and trade tax. The taking of these taxes were usually done directly by the caliphal bureaucracy, though there does exist some cases of mosque congregations collecting these taxes and some other collection forms. But usually these taxes went directly to the centralized caliphal treasury and were the main source of income for the centralized caliphal authority. And it is important here to understand that the Yizya and the Usher tax, especially, were tied to only non-Muslims and functioned 
as an incentivizing pressure to make people convert from their previous religions to the religion of Islam. It could be called a type of forced conversion method through economic pressure. Do it should be seen in the context that the alternative was using direct force to kill or torture people until they converted, which was the standard in for example the Byzantine Empire with their type of Christianity, and in the rest of Europe with regards to how you converted people to your faith. But as a conversion method it was very successful, too successful in certain regards, as more people converting to Islam meant less tax revenue for the centralized caliphal administration, which also meant the weakening of the centralized caliphal administration. As more people, the longer this policy was in place, converted to Islam, thus shrinking the tax base. And thus financial issues are noticeable in the later Abbasid period. And the Abbasids have to rely upon the tribute paid by local leaders and mosque congregations in order to stay afloat financially, which they were often not happy to oblige in and pay, creating schisms and fracturing the Abbasid Caliphate into smaller political entities. And those local leaders I discussed as not being connected to mosque congregations but still paying tribute. They are actually connected to a third system which was tribute from tributary tribes and kingdoms under caliphal authority, often agreed upon by personal and familial agreements between either the caliph or a local governor acting on behalf of the caliph or a mosque congregation that represented the caliph's interests in the region. These, together with the two other systems, made taxation in the early Arabic caliphates into a patchwork of various systems and agreements. Speaking about being a patchwork of systems, the taxation systems in Europe after the Roman Empire's fall began as a network of tributary systems of local lords and rulers having various familial agreements upon paying tribute. And it wasn't until the high medieval period and the renaissance where state-like taxation systems did emerge Though there was great variety in the various systems that developed in Europe, many of them actually began by copying the church's taking of the tithe as a standardized system. So they copied the Catholic Church and its organization regarding taking the tithe. And the Catholic Church system had its origins in the Roman system of tribute and tax collections, as the church in the late Roman Empire was part of the late Roman administration. This is also why basilicas, a term used for buildings, used for administration, has become a term for church generally. Because churches, even from the time of the Roman Empire, were centers for bureaucracy and taxation. And speaking about Roman times, just like in Rome, Many of the early renaissance and medieval taxation systems were based upon personal tax collection rather than a standardized bureaucracy. And like the publicani of the Roman times, tax farming was common, where people would be paid an amount of gold depending upon how much tax they managed to bring in according to certain quotas, which often caused issues during the late medieval and renaissance period due to conflicts with these tax collectors, these private tax collectors. For example, in Sweden there exists a lot of history and stories about conflicts with mercenary German tax collectors that were brought in during the late medieval and renaissance period. Following the renaissance period, over hundreds of years taxation would come more directly under bureaucratic centralized state control and would begin to replace tributary systems gradually. Though in certain places tributary systems actually existed into the 19th and 20th centuries. Now we have spoken about the development of some taxation systems throughout history. But I would like to actually bring a focus to what was the taxes or tribute paid in. Because often it was not in money as in coins. Because currency, metal currency, was rare in the past before industrialization and would have not been a good means of paying tax. And paper money 
was also unfeasible as it was not really a workable system with weak states that could not enforce anti-counterfeiting measures. This meant that in most cases, in pre-industrial times, payment was made in grain or in other products, sometimes even in humans, such as in the Ottoman Empire, taking children in order to bring them up as janissaries, slave soldiers for the Ottoman Empire. On the subject of slavery and work, work hours were also a common type of taxation or taxation payment, such as in the various corvée systems in Europe, where you would work instead of paying in coin. Sometimes this work also included military service, as in Sweden and the Ledung system, where you, if you were a free farmer, you were forced to provide either weapons or serve in the military yourself as a sort of tax. And in addition to Ledung, there existed a lot of other systems, such as grain payments too. In fact, a standardized system of payment in coin did not appear in Sweden until late in the 19th century where it became the standard payment of taxes by law. And some other places in Europe were even later in adopting coin as the standard of taxation, well into the early 20th century. My point with this is not that taxes were not paid in coin, because they were too, but that there existed a lot of flexibility in what could be taken as a tax, something which most modern taxation systems would not recognize as being a valid form of tax payment in place of money. This was a brief overview of taxes and tributes and their systems over the ages. I could have gone into a lot more, but I hope that this brief overview gave a bit more certainty about the second certainty of life. If not, and you still have questions or want to give other comments about this, then please post them. Please do subscribe as it would help the channel spread awareness about the humanities. اشترك بالقناة من فضلكم